Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2020 University of Mississippi School of Law Alumni Hall of Fame Ceremony. Tonight, we will be inducting five new members into the Hall of Fame. They are Boyce Holloman, Sherman Muths, Joy Phillips, Nasad Stewart, and David Swenson. Good evening. I'm Ben Griffith. I'm the president of the Law Alumni Chapter this year. I want to welcome all of you to the Law School Hall of Fame. Uh, these are the people who have been absolutely uh, pivotal in the success of the university, particularly during this past year and the past decade, in some cases, decades. Uh, we welcome all of you to this event. We thank you for looking in. Uh, regrettably, we can't do this live yet. Our hope is that we will be able to do an in-person uh, event similar to this later this year. We look forward to seeing all of you here. At this time, I'd like to introduce the uh, Dean of the Ole Miss Law School, uh, Dean Susan Duncan. Dean Duncan. Good evening. My name is Susan Duncan and I'm the Dean of the Law School. We had so many firsts this year. And of course, this is another first, the Law Alumni Awards virtually. I'm sad that we can't be together. The Alumni Awards are one of my favorite events of the year, where we get to celebrate the many accomplishments of our wonderful alums. But we're just gonna have to make do like we've done all year. Despite this year being very challenging, it's been an interesting year to run a law school during COVID, we've had so many successes. We started off by welcoming 167 1L students. Those students' grade points and GPA went up in every quartile. We also are about ready to announce some fantastic bar passage numbers. You know, and that took a lot of grit for those students because they kept changing the bar from online to in-person, they changed dates. It was very difficult for them to prepare and stay focused, but they did it, so we are so proud of them. In addition, our oral advocacy teams have had some great showings. Several of them made it to the semifinals of the nation, and we're so proud of them. Our clinics were incredibly active this year, all of the clinics, but I must mention the Innocence Project. Two of their clients were exonerated and came off a death row. That does not happen every year. As you can see, our faculty, staff, and students had so much grit and so much grace to get through this year. I could not be prouder of them. But we also are so proud of our wonderful alumni. We could not do this without your support. Our alumni had great years too. We had alumni become federal judges, get elected to office, and accomplish so many things in both their professional and personal lives. You are our inspiration for our students. You are the people I can point to to show them the value of an Ole Miss Law degree. I cannot thank you enough for all the things you do for this state and for the nation. We are truly proud of you. Tonight, I hope you enjoy hearing all the stories of all the fantastic people we are honoring. And next year, I hope we are all together so we can have a true celebration of the wonderful things you do. We are very proud of your achievements and look forward to celebrating many more in the years to come. And now I would like to introduce you to our Chancellor, Chancellor Glenn Boyce. Thank you so much and hotty toddy. Thank you, Dean Duncan. And let me tell you what an honor it is to welcome all of you to the celebration of our most recent Law Alumni Hall of Fame class. As we really get into the swing of 2021, we can't help but think of all the unique challenges we all faced over the past year. It makes me think about a, a word I hear a lot to describe our beloved university, enduring. Since 1848, our university has endured. Ole Miss has yet to face a challenge she cannot overcome. And the reasons for this are simple. We endure because of the standard of excellence that is ingrained in everything we do. We continue to endure year after year because of the outstanding quality of students, faculty, and staff on our campuses. 
and we endure because once students leave the university, they become alumni who go out into the world to accomplish great feats and represent their alma mater proudly. This year's program features a class of individuals you'll be proud to call alumni, friends, and family. As you know, our Gulf Coast has always been an important part of the state for the university. So an interesting note to share is that 60% of this year's class are from the coast. Additionally, this class includes trailblazers who were first in their fields and paved the way for generations to come. This class also includes an alum who has taken his Ole Miss education and used it to succeed in international business at the highest levels. All five of these individuals have accomplished amazing things with their careers and within their communities. One of the great benefits of working on campus is the opportunity to witness firsthand the high quality education our students receive. It is truly a highlight of my role as chancellor to know all the opportunities that lie ahead for our current students because of their excellent education. I also treasure celebrating the many accomplishments that happen once our students go on to become alumni. Taking part in events like this Hall of Fame ceremony and honoring this outstanding class of inductees really brings everything full circle. I urge all alumni to remember that at the university, we are among your biggest fans and will always be cheering for your success and happiness. As the line from the Frankie Everett Jr. poem states, the university gives a diploma and regretfully terminates tenure, but one never graduates from Ole Miss. I hope you enjoy the program the Law Alumni Chapter has put together to honor this Hall of Fame class. Though this presentation is virtual, please know that I look forward to seeing you all on campus very soon. Thank you for enduring with us through unprecedented times. With your support and dedication, we will always prevail. And may God bless you all. Our first inductee of the night is Boyce Holloman. Well, it's um, a great privilege to talk about my friend Boyce Holloman. Boyce was a kind of polymath at life. He was a genius in so many different ways. And uh, I mean, in the sense that he was a member of the greatest generation. He, um, he was a naval aviator who uh, literally put his life on the line and almost lost it uh, in the uh, um, attack on Saipan. He was, he was piloting a torpedo bomber and got shot down. Um, much of his body was burned and he was out, out there in the water uh, and if the plane had sunk um, or if the Japanese had strafed it or any of those things, uh, he could have been gone. And Boyce spent the rest of his life helping other people. Came back and I, I had the sense that he just wanted to live life. He, he was a, a um, so good at so many things after that. He was a grand, life grandmaster at Bridge. He was a master trial lawyer. He had, um, he, he had a wonderful love of Ole Miss. He, he had a zest for life that um, caused him to just fill up the room and be a wonderful raconteur. And, and uh, I've, I've heard him sing Danny Boy and he would know all the, all the verses of it, you know. Yeah, we had we had so much fun together. And he he went to many Ole Miss games. That was one of his great pleasures in life. His his friends Pete Wilson, Bob Reagan, and all those guys that were around there. And and Dizzy Dean. He was if you watched uh, Dizzy and and Pee Wee Reese on the on the television back in those days. Uh, he would sing Wombash Cannonball and he would say, I want to send this out to my old friend Boyce Holloman down there because they played golf together. Boyce was a great golfer. Boyce was elect elected to the legislature while he was in law school and uh, came back from the war, you know, as the greatest generation did and, and really plowed into uh, a, the, the, the life of America. That was what he was making. Was uh, and he created a family that was a wonderful family here. He came from a good family. Uh, his children, I mean, they, he was so proud of of, uh, of David and Diane and Mike and Dean and Tim and Beth. I mean, 
Uh, they just, they just, he always talked about them and, and uh, they, they looked up to him and, and he was a fine father for them. He was such an orator. I remember one time in the courtroom, we had him uh, talking about something and he said, uh, I'd hate to have him talk. And we said, no, come on boys, talk. And he said, well, I will try to draw the bow of eloquence across those Stradivarian strings of oratorical splendor for you. I mean, that was Boyce. He was just flamboyant and, and uh, outgoing and, and, and made fun, kind of fun of himself, but he was really good at what he did. He was the best natural trial lawyer I think I've ever seen. And, you know, a lot of the characteristics of a good lawyer are, is, is bound in knowing human nature. Boyce had a heart that, that reached out to other people. And for that reason, it kind of translated into the, to the acting as well, because he could, he, uh, you know, I think it was Aristotle that said one of the uh, characteristics of a, of a work of art is that it moves the audience. Boyce could, uh, I wish you could see him. He, he was president of the bar, but, but uh, the year I was active in the bar, I asked him to come down and do the Clarence Darrow show, which was a one-man show. We had seen Henry Fonda do that in, in, uh, at an ABA convention. I have to tell you that Boyce's portrayal of Darrow was better than Henry Fonda because he had been in the courtroom and he had seen all these things happen and lived it, and you could tell that, and it, and it moved the audience. One thing about Boyce Holloman, I have to say, was that he did not carry a grudge. He would, he would be the toughest opponent in the world, always prepared, very knowledgeable of the law. But he, he, he would come and shake hands with you afterwards, and usually after he pins you to the mat. As Bidwell Adams said when he, when he nominated him for the presidency of the bar, he said, I've felt the sting of his rapier. And many of us had. He was a progressive, he was a good man, he had believed in education, and above all else, he loved Ole Miss. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee, Boyce Holloman. Accepting the award on behalf of the Boyce Holloman family is his son, Tim Holloman, and his grandson, Hollis Holloman. My name is Tim Holloman. I have with me uh, Hollis Holloman. Uh, we're both attorneys, of course, here in South Mississippi. My father was Boyce Holloman, and Hollis is his grandson. Uh, we are pleased and happy to accept the induction of our father, Boyce Holloman, into the Ole Miss Law School Hall of Fame. Um, I only wish he were here to accept it himself. Uh, we miss him, but he's always with us. There's not a day that goes by that people don't come and tell me a story about some interaction with, with Dad. Uh, he was a great lawyer uh, and great person. He loved people. That was what made him such a good lawyer. He uh, identified with all people of all walks of life. Probably my favorite story about dad was when he was in the hospital and he was walking down the hallway and two men were up on a ladder painting the, the walls. And, and as dad walked by, these two men stepped off the ladder and they took their hats off and put them over their heart as dad walked by. And dad's response was, as we walked by, you know, my greatest achievement in life was is to be admired by men such as that. But he was a common person's man. He loved people. Uh, he took care of people. Uh, in, in the practice of law, one of the things I've always remembered is many, many, many times he would make us as young lawyers represent people for free. And he would say that, you know, lawyers' job in life is not just to make money, but it is to help people people that can't help themselves. And so I hope he's instilled that in us. He now has six Hollomans that are lawyers, uh, myself and Dean and Mike and Chris and Hollis. And his voice. Boyce. Boyce, oh, Jill, uh, his grandson, Boyce, who's about to graduate from SMU. That's why I didn't count him yet, I guess. But he's gonna be a fine young lawyer too. And uh, we really appreciate it. It's a great honor. Uh, he was, well deserving of this award. He loved Old Miss Law School. He told great stories about Old Miss Law School. When he was in law school, he told he tried his first case in civil court, a jury trial against his law professor, and he lost. <laughs> he 
He didn't lose many after that, but he lost that one. His professor taught him a few few tricks of the trade during the case, but it was a famous case in Oxford. If you go back and uh, look at the news clips of it, it was all over the front pages of the newspaper because this law student was trying a case against his law professor. But we really do appreciate it. Uh, and it's just been a great honor for him and a great testament to him serving the people of Mississippi as a lawyer in many, many capacities. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee, Boyce Holloman. Our next inductee is Sherman Muths. I first met Sherman when he was courting Celia Carter, one of the most beautiful girls from Quitman, Mississippi, in my hometown. After all said and done, and I will be mentioning several of Sherman's accomplishments and honors, I think he would agree with me that one of the most important days in his life was the day Celia agreed to marry him. Celia and Sherman were blessed with a son, Sherman III, or as he is affectionately known as Little Sherm. Little Sherm gave Celia and Big Sherm uh, two beautiful granddaughters, Izzy and Meg, both of whom are very accomplished young women. Sherman grew up in Gulfport, graduating from Gulfport High School. After he graduated from Old Miss Law School, he and Celia moved to Gulfport. Anyone who knows Sherman would understand that you will, would never be able to get him to permanently locate uh, away from the waters of the Gulf Coast, which he loves. From the beginning, Gulfport has been an important part of their lives. Sherman was chosen as Gulfport's outstanding young man, and he founded a business club in Gulfport. He has served as a chairman of the and president of the Gulfport Chamber of Commerce and was the founder of Vision Gulf Coast, which identified and sought reconciliation and solutions to racial issues. Through all of this, I can assure you Sherman recognized the old adage that all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. In this regard, he founded the Gulfport Wine Society, which has provided an untold number of fun times for the members. Sherman was captain and owner of a boat, which was pro appropriately named the Hotty Toddy. He frequently treated his family and friends to wonderful adventures in the Gulf. And who would ever forget the wonderful times that were enjoyed at the Muth's Condominium on Grand Cayman Island? Great times. Between his undergraduate law degree from Ole Miss, he served three years active duty in the Air Force. He was a navigator on international flights. After his active duty, he served in the office of the judge, staff judge advocate at Kiesler Air Base from 1960 through 1970. To simply say that Sherman was and is an enthusiastic supporter of all things Ole Miss, but though true, just doesn't give you a true picture of what he has done. His service to Ole Miss began when he was president of, the, of his fraternity, Sigma Nu. During this year, as president, a new fraternity house was built. Sherman went on to serve as president of the Ole Miss um, Alumni Association, and in recognition of its services, he was inducted into the Alumni Association Hall of Fame. He not only gave him his time and talent, he and Celia have generously supported Ole Miss financially. During more than 40 years of law practice, Sherman gave generously of his time and talent to his profession. That included serving as president of the Harrison County Bar Association, uh, the Ole Miss Law Alumni Association, the Lamar Order, and the Bar Foundation. During his service as the Bar Foundation, the, Guffs, the Law Center was completed in Jackson, and it has been a great asset uh, to this profession uh, in Mississippi. Beyond all of this, it's hard to comprehend where Sherman find time to serve in the Mississippi Legislature, chair of the Gulf Fishery Management Council, and chair of the Mississippi Home Corporation, which issued bonds for low and middle income people to buy, be able to buy homes. One of the most interesting projects, however, was the where he was founder and co-owner of the Mississippi Sea Wolves, a professional ice hockey team. Notwithstanding all of Sherman's many accomplishments and honors, I believe he would tell you that the service from which he would derive the most satisfaction and sense of accomplishment 
would be his many years of active involvement with Gulfport Trinity Methodist Church, which included serving on the Methodist Foundation Board and the Methodist Children's Home. In recounting Sherman's many accomplishments, I would be remiss if I did not mention Celia, who in the words of Bette Miller's song, has truly been the wind under the Sherman's wings through all these years. Due to the brevity of time allotted, I've been unable to recount all of Sherman's honors and accomplishments. So I'll conclude my remarks by saying, first, Sherman, thank you for your many years of service. You richly deserve this award. And secondly, on a personal note, and on behalf of my family, thank you and Celia for the years of friendship. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee, Sherman Muths. Dean Duncan, members of the law class of 60, fellow lawyers, ladies and gentlemen, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight and I would like to thank the law school for this significant honor. I am truly, truly flattered. Never while practicing law or thereafter did I ever envision this happening, and I thank the law school for this honor. In the summer of 1957, a group of law students began law class and they'll be known hereafter as the class of 1960. They were comprised mainly of single male students, and we all lived in level, in the level hall, level dormitory. There we studied, we worked, we parted, we did all these things together and became very, very close friends. Uh, we uh, we like to, to tell stories about those days in level, but I think for this occasion, it's probably best that I don't tell any of these stories in order to protect the innocent. <laughs> uh, while, uh, while we worked hard on the weekdays, we became ordinary students on the weekends. And uh, some of us enjoyed football and decided to see every Ole Miss game played that year. We were fortunate, very fortunate, because we picked the team of the decade and they lost only to, to uh, LSU on the cannon run. However, Ole Miss came back in the Sugar Bowl and whooped LSU 21 to nothing, so we got even. There was one thing that was significant on all these overnight trips. In order to save money, we would engage two large double connecting rooms. And at times we decided when it was lights out, then it was boys to one room, girls to another room. Now let me tell you what. That wasn't easy. I'd just been married two or three years, I mean two or three months, just like everybody else. And then to give Celia a kiss, good night, at a celebratory weekend and see her go off with all the girls, that was tough. But we all did through it who were married and we had a lot of fun doing it. We were truly blessed to have really, really good professors. And these professors became not only teachers, but they became good friends. And some of these law school professors could party with the best. I remember one law school party downtown in Oxford at a restaurant, and it kind of got kind of wild later in the night. And the next day, a couple of us were talking, and somebody said, it did get wild. It finally ended. And the only one standing was a professor from the law school. 
A special memory we have of Dr. John Hanna, who was a visiting professor at Ole Miss. Uh, he was quiet, did not have many friends, and we liked him. Uh, he was formal, but he was a great conversationalist, and the reason I'm bringing that up, we had him several times to our efficiency apartment to have dinner. Now, let me tell you what this efficiency apartment was. It was efficient. It was brand new in Vet Village, and it was a total of 18 feet square. Brand new, no air conditioning, one window, a front door, and a bathroom door, and that was it. But we got it all fine, and we enjoyed it. And I remember the first time that we had Dr. Hanna for dinner, and uh, he was the consummate gentleman, and he believed in, you know, bringing a hostess gift when you came to dinner. And so Celia met him at the door, and he was, it was formal, but he was a great conversationalist. And he said, Mrs. Muse, I wanted to get some posies, but I couldn't find the right ones. But, but so instead, I have this for you. And, she, and he delivered to her a canned ham. Now, don't denigrate a canned ham. Because to a bunch of old Miss Law students, that was an absolute pure delicacy. A, a, uh, in 1960, there were 30 students who graduated with our class. About 15 have stayed in touch and attended the old Miss class reunions. And in fact, in the mid 1970s, the class of 60 started its own reunion and it meets and has met annually at the Ole Miss Law School reunion. But we were only interrupted after all these many years with a pandemic. So we finally, finally broke the ceiling and uh, we had a wonderful time and we'll start it, start it again. In closing, I would like to give credit to the Ole Miss Law School for whatever success I may have accomplished in life. We were taught at the law school not only about law, but about life itself. And the effort was to make us all well-rounded students who were ready to meet the new world. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee, Sherman Muths. Our next inductee is Joy Phillips. Well, I met Joy at, uh, at Ole Miss in undergraduate class. We had a few classes together. She was always the smart girl that sat at the front of the, gla the class and always had the answer to the professor's questions when they called on her. But she was a, a top-notch student in undergraduate law school, very serious uh, about doing well in school, uh, in law school. She and Frank were married, and uh, Frank likes to tell the story of how she wouldn't let him come visit on weekends. He was working in, uh, in North Mississippi and uh, would come down to see her on weekends, and if she had something serious going on in law school, she would just simply tell him he couldn't come. Where we really became friends, though, was when we worked together in the legal department of Deposit Guarantee Bank. Uh, Joy had graduated from law school. She was in private practice with a litigation law firm. And her law firm defended the bank in a huge piece of litigation, maybe one of the most serious cases that had ever been filed against, against the bank. Had a successful outcome uh, in, in large part due to her efforts and her, her partners and colleagues' efforts in the firm. But uh, we then recruited her heavily to, to join the legal department of the bank, and fortunately she did. So we worked alongside each other for 13 plus years until the bank was acquired by another institution. And that's how she came to move to the Gulf Coast and become uh, 
first outside counsel and then inside general counsel for Hancock Whitney Bank. I'm reminded of the time when we worked together in the legal department of deposit guarantee and uh, the bank was in negotiations to be acquired by another institution. And so on a, on a weekend, a big group of people, including lawyers, came from Nashville to Jackson to do some due diligence. And so we all met with uh, all of the legal staff from the bank in Nashville and uh, met with their executive officers and discussed kind of you know what we do, how we do things, and uh, explaining to them what, what our, our organization was like. And uh, Joy goes off to a meeting with a group of people, and of course everybody's introducing themselves to each other and explaining what departments they work in and that sort of thing. And she introduces herself to this gentleman, everybody's dressed casually and whatnot, and she says, you know, I'm Joy Phillips, I'm in the legal department of the bank. And she said, uh, he said, well, hi, my name's Denny. And she said, what department do you work in, Denny? He said, well, he said, I would be the chairman of the board. And, and, and if that wasn't enough, uh, later at, at lunch, uh, they had pick up sandwiches, order out lunch boxes. And Joy goes down to get one of the last remaining boxes. She was a little late to the, to the table to pick up lunch. And she picks up a vegetarian sandwich. Well, it turns out that that was the special sandwich that the chairman of the board had ordered for lunch. So we get back upstairs to the legal department and Charles Parrott, who worked with us in the legal department as well, looked at Joy and said, Joy, the legal department is toast. He said, we're not gonna survive. <laughs> and so I like to say that that's how Joy came to move to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And, and that was Hancock Whitney's good fortune to, to have her join them. If you look at her uh, achievements, first of all, her professional achievements, um, a long, successful legal career, first as a litigator and then as a corporate lawyer, um, a senior executive officer for the largest financial institution in the state, and I think really the largest public company headquartered in the state of Mississippi. Um, her service to the bar, uh, as the first woman president of the Mississippi Bar in 2005 uh, and service in many capacities in the bar prior to that time and since that time. Her service to the, uh, to the profession in terms of uh, volunteer work as chair of the Access to Justice Commission appointed by the uh, Mississippi Supreme Court Chief Justice and her service on the Mississippi Volunteer uh, Lawyers Project her service in the community in the Gulf Coast area. She's the uh, chairman of the board of directors of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. Uh, and I know she's done lots of volunteer work for other, other local charities and organizations on the Gulf Coast. So, you know, professional, personal achievements. Um, I, I think it just, she just is a great role model and inspiration for law students, for new law graduates, for young lawyers, men and women, maybe especially women and, and demonstrating what can be accomplished with really serious dedication and uh, a really serious work ethic uh, and a commitment and uh, overcoming whatever obstacles, frankly, were put in front of her. I'm sure there were, there were many. Um, so I think she's just a terrific role model and an inspiration for, for everybody in the profession. Joy, I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to call you my friend and I'm really thrilled to see you receive this well-deserved recognition. Uh, love you, I appreciate all that you've done for me over the years and I just wanna wish you a, a hearty congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee Joy Phillips. I want to thank the University of Mississippi Law School, the Alumni Association, the Lamar Order, um, as well as Dean Duncan and the Selection Committee. Um, this is truly the honor of a lifetime. The law school opened up doors beyond anything I could have ever imagined. Um, but not only am I honored to have been selected for this, but to be included in a class with these outstanding fellow honorees, it makes it even more special. Um, some of them I already know, um, others I had never met, uh, but I've known of their remarkable accomplishments. So this is truly a special honor. Um, I wish for so many reasons 
that we could all be together in person, but I appreciate the law school putting this virtual event together. Um, I wanna especially recognize the efforts of Scott Thompson and Joseph Kennedy. Um, I'm not a big Zoom fan, um, but Joseph has tried his best to make this the least painful experience. Um, but let's be honest, um, nobody really looks good on Zoom. Um, your head's either too big, you're too close to the camera, whatever it is, uh, but, but he's tried his best. The university, but particularly the law school, um, means a lot to me. Um, it afforded me an excellent education and provided opportunities um, I never could have thought possible. Um, I was the first in my extended family to receive a four-year college. I don't think I'd ever even met a lawyer until I was in high school. Um, yet the university gave me the same consideration and opportunity as anyone else. Um, not only did Ole Miss give me a great education, but it's where I met my long suffering husband, Frank. Um, our marriage somehow survived my law school journey. And when I graduated in 1980, there were still not many women in law school and the Law Wives organization was still giving out PhDs. And in Frank's case, it was putting her through. Um, he was very proud of it. He still has it. It's framed in his office. Um, so we're both grateful. Um, my friends refer to my husband as St. Frank. And if we were meeting in person, he'd be there cheering me on. But seated next to him would be my mother. She's definitely my number one cheerleader. And if we'd been able to meet last year, my brother Keith would probably have been there for me to thank as well. Um, he came to, be, to watch me be sworn in as bar president in 2005 and outgoing in 2006. Um, but sadly, he passed away earlier this year. But I can tell you, he's probably watching this video right now and he's toasting me with a Budweiser. So, so thank you, Keith. Um, others I'd be thanking and hugging, and I'm a big hugger, um, include Professors Guff Abbott, John Bradley, um, several former deans, um, as well as Dean Duncan, who is doing an incredible job at the law school. Um, I do have one comment I want to make about Guff Abbott. He never ceases to amaze me how he remembers names. To this day 40, day, 40 years later, he still remembers my full name, which sometimes I have a hard time remembering. Patricia Joy Lambert Phillips, and he always greets me that way. Um, I am forever grateful to him, but also all the other professors and deans that I um, had the pleasure of um, either studying under or working with um, over the years, all of who influenced my life and my career. Um, if we were in meeting in person, I would thank my friends in attendance, including law school classmates, former state bar presidents, too many of them to mention by name, but all of whom supported me over the years. And it truly took a village to get me here today. Um, Cliff Harrison, my friend to my former boss, um, thank you for your kind remarks um, and for asking me ahead of time if there were any stories you were not to tell. So thank you very much. Um, I thank Hancock Whitney Bank for its support of my bar activities, um, whether as bar president, access to justice commission or other bar activities, um, they've been so supportive. Um, I've probably exceeded my time. Um, so let me close again by again thanking the law school, the dean um, and everyone else who had a part of my nomination or selection. Um, this was an incredible and humbling honor. And thank you to all those who supported and cheered me all these years. So here's hoping that we'll get to see um, each other in person next year. And thank you again for sharing this time with me. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee Joy Phillips. Our next inductee is Nasad Stewart. I met Nasad um, August of 1967. Uh, we were living in, well, I was assigned to Ricks Hall, which is a graduate uh, dormitory at the university. And uh, when I moved in, Narset was in the bed. And she looked at me and I looked at her like, you know, who are you? And um, she was almost 14 or 15 years older than I than I was. And it was just like living with, the, with your older sister. But we were soulmates. Uh, I, I, she was one of my she was one of my best friends. Nas said was pretty much a quiet type of person, but very principled. I recall her strength when Dr. King was assassinated, and uh, we were in the library that night, 
And when we both found out about it, she was enraged. And I was always, you know, going off, getting up, you know, upset at racism. I just, but she had a way of dealing with it. She was angry, but she had a mature way of dealing with it. But this particular instance, I, I saw a nurse said that I had never seen before. And it just, it spoke to her character. While I was furious and angry and mad and ready to walk and do whatever, she was angry and hurt. And I learned then that she was a, a very compassionate person, even though at times she tried to act like she was not. I guess that was part of her persona as a teacher. She had been a teacher at West Point for 14 years before she uh, went to Atlanta uh, Clark College to get her master's. So she had uh, a calmness about herself. But I, I realized then that she was a very strong woman. Uh, professionally, when I said graduated uh, in May of 1970, uh, prior to that time, I believe it was in 1969, she was the first African American to be uh, placed on the law journal. And, and that was very difficult because Nase was very smart. She should have been on the law journal before then. But uh, things as, you know, being as they were then. But she made it. And she was an excellent writer. Uh, that, was, that was something they could not take from her. So when we got out of law, when she graduated in May, I had graduated in January. Uh, she went to work with uh, LCDC, Lawyers Constitutional Defense Committee. She and Geraldine Carnes. And um, Nasa stayed there for about two years. And she left there uh, and went to Anderson Banks, Nichols, and Leventhal. She stayed there and then she went to um, the, the law firm became Anderson Banks and Stewart. She, left, she stayed there, I think, for about two or three years. Uh, and then she went to work with uh, John Walker and stayed there maybe two years. Then she became chief counsel for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the Law, and she kept that job for two, two years, I believe. And that was a place where I worked when I first got out of law school. I, I just loved the Lawyers Committee. It was just uh, really interesting. People came down from the North and, and gave you experiences, some of which were, were not good, uh, but it, it made me realize that um, racism is not just here in the South. Uh, it, it, it's uh, it's all over, and uh, so I was introduced to that, and she became uh, very much aware of the realities of life that, as well. When she left the Lawyers Committee, they closed the office in Mississippi. When she left there, she started working with Minac, uh, and that's a job um, job creation uh, program. I think they have about maybe 15 different sites across the. the uh, the nation. Um, after then, Nas said uh, retired. She served, I believe, on the Civil Service Commission. But um, she retired and um, went home uh, to Jackson. Nas said was very special to the state, uh, very special to the legal profession here. Uh, she and I were uh, we served as secretary to the Magnolia Bar Association right after we got out of law school. And we were like mothers to the young lawyers who got out. Uh, and we tried to uh, mentor them. I just wish that there were more people like Norset. Uh, Norset was very giving. She was not a selfish person. Uh, she was selfless. I, um, when I left the university, I vowed I would never come back because of what happened there and, and how I was received and how I felt for two and a half years that I was not welcomed. So when I left, that was it. And it was not until one of the students from the Black Law Student Association asked me to come and speak. And then Professor Mike Hoffenheimer, he encouraged me to come back. Now I said, was felt the same way that I felt. But she was never invited back. So it means so very much to me. It brings that closure that I have 
in my heart. And I can start smiling now and say, no, sis, you did it. And my only regret is that she's not here to, um, to receive that long overdue honor. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee, Nasad Stewart. Accepting the award on behalf of the Nossad Stewart family is her great nephew, John Nell Knox. Greetings, Chancellor Boyce, Dean Duncan, members of the Ole Miss Law School faculty, alumni, and friends. My name is John L. Knox, the great nephew of attorney Nossad Stewart. I and the family of my great aunt would like to thank Chancellor Boyce, Dean Duncan, Ole Miss Law alumni, and the nomination and voting committee members on inducting my great aunt into the Ole Miss Law School Hall of Fame. It is with great honor to have her recognized with such a distinguished award. For many years, my aunt was committed to her family, the local Jackson, Mississippi community, as well as the practice of law. As a civil rights attorney in the 80s, she represented my great grandmother and a group of black teachers who had not received equal pay for work performed educating students across the state of Mississippi. And guess what? She won the class action lawsuit. I did not recognize some of the impacts that my aunt had made until I started teaching criminal justice courses in Chicago. During a casual conversation with my late mentor, attorney Lewis Myers Jr., who also attended Ole Miss Law School, informed me that not only did he know my aunt, he had worked for her in Mississippi after completing law school. Such a small world, huh? I must take a moment to recognize and thank two of her closest friends, attorney Constance Connie Slaughter Harvey and attorney Fred Banks. She often spoke of the great friendship and the professional work they had done together. I would like to end by saying the practice of law is a noble and rewarding profession. My aunt Nosset was very committed and passionate about this work and equality for all. In a time of social justice, the work is not only important, it is necessarily for future generations. I am sure that she would have been honored to receive this award. On behalf of the family and friends of attorney Nosset Stewart, I thank you again for inducting her into the Ole Miss Law School Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee, Nasad Stewart. Our final inductee of the night is David Swinson. First, I'd like to say it's my honor and a real pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce David Swinson. It's crazy to think it's been 30 years since I walked into Mr. Swinson's office at Baker and McKenzie to interview with him. He was looking to replace his first and only other assistant since he graduated law school because she was moving out of the area. Yes, David has had only two assistants in his 44 year career, which actually in and of itself speaks volumes to his character, personality, and demeanor. Although the interview went well, I ended up accepting another position that I mistakenly thought offered me a better opportunity to grow my career. After a few short weeks, though, in the other position, I quickly realized the error of my ways. And luckily, when I checked back, he had not filled the position. So we met again, and as they say, the rest is history. Looking back at Ole Miss Law School, David graduated with honors and was a member and articles editor of the Mississippi Law Journal. He was also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Space Law and a member of the Phi Delta Phi Honor Society. In his third year of law school, David was elected president of the law school student body and he was faculty selection to receive the Dean Parham Williams Award, presented to the outstanding student in his graduating class. David received his JD and BA from Ole Miss and went on to receive his LLM from Georgetown University Law School, where he was the associate editor of the Tax Lawyer Journal. As David's career flourished, he achieved an almost unbelievably outstanding legal career, which spanned three decades, beginning when he joined the international law firm of Baker & McKenzie, where he was a tax partner for more than 20 years, in addition to holding various roles in the firm's Washington national and global management teams. 
Over the years, David participated in an incredible 350 plus tax controversies involving audits and disputes between multinational companies and the IRS and revenue authorities in more than two dozen other countries. Known for his strong intellect and powerful advocacy skills and his unrelenting drive to achieve success for each client, many of those cases came to reach landmark favorable decisions for the companies. David also participated as an amicus curiae in several landmark tax cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. He has been aptly described as one of the top five tax controversy experts in the United States and has been recognized by Chambers USA, Legal Experts Guide, World's Leading Tax Controversy Advisors, and by the annual International Tax Reviews Tax Controversy Leaders Guide for 11 consecutive years. If all this was not enough, seeking new challenges after retiring from Baker and McKinsey in 2007, David joined PricewaterhouseCoopers, one of the big four international professional service firms, to create and develop a global tax controversy practice. So, he became the founder and global leader of PwC's Tax Controversy and Dispute Resolution Network, which grew to include over 1,200 tax professionals from more than 80 countries. At PwC, I worked alongside David as the network driver to help facilitate his many ideas and initiatives and to connect the network members from around the world. David was also selected to become the co-deputy global leader of PwC's Legal Services Network, including more than 3,700 attorneys worldwide. And just a few years ago, David initiated and chaired a feasibility and implementation team that ultimately led to the groundbreaking formation of ILC Legal, an independent U.S. law firm in Washington and member of the PwC Global Network. By all accounts, David is extraordinarily deserving of being inducted into the University of Mississippi School of Law Hall of Fame. He is one of only a handful of professionals in his area of expertise who has achieved unprecedented success and brand recognition on a global basis, and yet, consistently throughout his career, he has also made time to give back to the legal community in a number of ways. He has developed a well-recognized brand over the years as an exceptional tax professional with boundless energy, as sometimes referred to as the ultimate energizer bunny, and with the ability to bring fresh perspectives and skillful strategies to helping his clients navigate difficult tax controversies, all the while interjecting his personal style, which brings something in addition to expertise and understanding and acceptance across cultures around the world and with a sense of humor that is more than welcome when dealing with difficult and complex issues. Aside from taking good care of his many clients, David also recognized the importance of sharing his knowledge and experience with the upcoming tax professionals of the future. And so he truly enjoyed teaching international tax and transfer pricing courses at Georgetown University Law Center, where he was an adjunct professor for over 25 consecutive years. Additionally, David has served the legal profession in a number of roles over the years, including Chairman of the Transfer Pricing Subcommittee of the ABA Tax Section, Chairman of the International Tax and Finance Forum, Co-Chairman of the Advisory Board of the Annual Institute on International Taxation, which was sponsored by the IRS and George Washington University, and for which he received a Meritorious Service Certificate from the Treasury Department and the IRS, and he was also chairman of the International Tax Committee of the D.C. Bar Association. And perhaps standing as his highest life achievement, David has been a dedicated husband, a father and mentor to his children, and a warm grandfather to his growing family. It has been my real pleasure to be a part of David Swenson's career and an adjunct member of the exceptional Swenson family all these years. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee, David Swinson. Good evening. I'm David Swinson, and it's my pleasure to be with you at the induction ceremony for the University of Mississippi Law School Alumni Hall of Fame. I wish we could be together face to face in Oxford and on campus, but the COVID virus prevented that from happening. In these challenging times, I want to acknowledge the efforts of so many people 
to bring us together virtually for this special event. I hope next year for the 2022 Law Weekend, we will be able to gather on the beautiful Ole Miss campus. Thank you for the opportunity to provide these remarks at this year's induction ceremony. Right up front, I want to say that I plan to break from my normal tradition of telling a few jokes, because with no live audience and only silence in the background, if I did tell a few, everyone would say, well, I didn't hear a single person laugh. I'd like to thank Ben Griffith, the law alumni president, for his warm words of welcome, Dean Duck Duncan for your encouraging remarks on the state of the Ole Miss Law School, and Chancellor Boyce for your comments on how the university has responded well to past and present challenges. We are indeed fortunate to have both of you leading the university and the law school navigating these turbulent times. And a special thanks to Pamela Shuey, my longtime assistant, for those kind words of introduction and for the more than 30 years we've worked together on many important challenges and opportunities. And thank you to Scott Thompson and Joseph Kennedy for organizing this event and for making the process smooth and seamless. To begin, I want to thank the Law School Alumni Association, Dean Duncan, the Hall of Fame Selection Committee, the Lamar Order, and others at the Law School for selecting me to be part of this year's Hall of Fame class. There are two words that best describe my feelings on this special occasion. Those words are honored and grateful. I'm honored to join this group of outstanding law alumni, and I'm grateful to so many people who made this day possible. You know, the origins of the University of Mississippi Law School actually go back 167 years to 1854. Yet prior to this year's class, only 50 individuals have received the honor of being inducted into the Hall of Fame. And what an impressive group it is, including former governors and lieutenant governors, past members of the judiciary, including the Mississippi Supreme Court, former presidents of the Mississippi State Bar, past members of the U.S. Congress, past deans of the law school and legendary professors, a former chancellor of the university, and many other outstanding lawyers from across the state who built impressive legal practices and served the profession for many years. It is hard to find the words to express how proud I am to be included in this impressive group of Ole Miss Law alumni. When I reviewed the list of prior Hall of Fame inductees, another fact struck me on a very personal level. I have been extraordinarily fortunate to have at least 11 Hall of Fame members who either taught me in law school or otherwise advised or mentored me along the way. There are too many to name them all, but I will say the list includes Professors Champion, Bradley, and Abbott, Dean Williams, Chancellor Kayat, and Governors Winter and Waller and Judge Clark, all members of the Ole Miss Hall of Fame. Back in law school, when I received the honor of the Dean Parham Williams Award in my last year of law school, I never dreamed that one day I would join Dean Williams himself in the Law School Alumni Hall of Fame. And I'm excited to say that today is that day. And there were others at the law school who had a significant impact, including Professors Green, Grove, and Cochran. In fact, in an interesting twist of fate, in 1976, I was enrolled in Professor Cochran's U.S. Supreme Court practice class, and I prepared a draft petition for a writ of certiorari in the Guy versus Robinson Myers case, an important matter on employment discrimination claim by Ms. Guy, an African-American woman. Based on my work in that class, Professor Cochran recommended that I assist with the brief on the merits to the Supreme Court. Professor Cochran's recommendation was made to an outstanding young African-American lawyer based in Memphis who was handling the case. That attorney was A.C. Wharton, who is also now in the Hall of Fame, inducted as part of the 2019 class. 
I would like to thank all of those who enriched my experience in law school and beyond and who inspired me to practice at the highest level of our profession. I also want to acknowledge what a privilege it is for me to be included as part of this year's Hall of Fame class. My fellow inductees are truly outstanding alumni. I'm proud to be part of this group and its varied background and with the diversity that it represents, including longstanding private practitioners who built impressive legacies over many years of service to the bar, and true pioneers, including the first female president of the Mississippi Bar and the first African American to serve on the Mississippi Law Journal. It is an honor for me to join this distinguished class. Something else struck me when I reviewed the list of Hall of Fame members. As you would perhaps expect, almost all of the prior and current inductees spent the majority, if not all, of their legal careers in the state of Mississippi, and, and they made significant contributions either through public service, as deans or professors at the law school, or as outstanding private practitioners in Mississippi. In light of that fact, I am particularly honored to join this group because after receiving my law degree and despite having lived in Mississippi all of my life, I decided to take a road less traveled. In fact, I've been extremely fortunate to in a sense represent Mississippi and Ole Miss in a different way, practicing international law in Washington, New York, and indeed around the world. I'm proud to say that my roots run deep in Mississippi for me personally, it includes Jackson, Clarksdale, and Tunica, and then extended to Oxford, Yachna, and Ole Miss. I come from humble beginnings, born in Jackson, raised by my mother and grandmother in Northwest Mississippi, and then back in Jackson, graduating from Murrah High School and Hines Junior College before enrolling at Ole Miss at the start of my junior year. You know, to this day, I remember my first undergraduate class at Ole Miss. It was Mississippi history, 1540 to present, with the legendary history professor, David Sansing. There is a great deal I could cover from those early days as a student, through law school, and my legal career. But as they say, there's a long backstory here and not enough time to cover it all. So I will summarize my thoughts with this. Oxford and Ole Miss provided the foundation for two of the most important pillars in my life, my family and my legal career. On the personal side, I first met my lifelong mate in the summer before my senior year of undergraduate school when Melinda McManus, Lynn, walked into the stockroom of the Big K department store on Jackson Avenue where I was working. One year later, we were married at the Oxford Church of Christ on North Lamar, and I started law school less than three months later. Lynn and I have had a blessed life together for the last 46, almost 47 years, and it all started for us in Oxford at the Big K. With respect to my professional career, it also started in Oxford and at Ole Miss with the education I received as an undergraduate student and in law school. At that time, I dreamed of practicing international law, and immediately after graduation from law school, my education at Ole Miss enabled me to join Baker & McKenzie, the world's largest law firm, where I stayed for 30 years and then continued my career when I joined PricewaterhouseCoopers, one of the world's largest professional services firms, where I've been now for the last 14 years. At Baker, I joined its foreign trade and international tax practice, endured baptism by fire, received an LLM in taxation from Georgetown University Law School, and I was asked to teach at Georgetown Law School for one year as an adjunct faculty member. But I enjoyed it so much that I then continued teaching there for 25 years. During my career at Baker and PwC, I was able to build a corporate practice specializing in international law, cross-border transactions, international taxation, and global tax controversy and dispute resolution. It has been said that the purpose of legal education is to equip the student 
with the necessary theoretical and practical skills to deal with our constantly changing and diverse world. I'm thankful that the legal education I received at Ole Miss equipped me to practice law at the highest levels of what is called today big law and to represent clients in the United States and around the world on difficult and challenging matters. The teaching and learning I received at Ole Miss in fundamental legal principles, strong analytical reasoning, legal research and writing, and practical skills enabled me to build a practice that spanned 44 years and is still going strong today. One of the additional benefits I received from my Ole Miss education and my international legal practice has been to literally travel the world working on legal matters and making presentations in more than 30 different countries. I've had the privilege to represent and interact with people from many different cultures and ethnic backgrounds. I've been honored to make presentations before the OECD in Paris, the Bar Association in Me Mexico City, the Legal Society in Hong Kong, and a special presentation on international tax dispute resolution at the Russian Supreme Court in Moscow. And in turn, these business opportunities have enabled me to, let's say, enjoy many other unusual personal experiences, like riding a one hump camel in the desert outside Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, enjoying unusual creatures at dinners in Japan and China, and enduring the fast moving and freezing currents in the Aar River surrounding Bern, Switzerland. I'm proud to say that all of this would not have been possible without my legal education at Ole Miss and the strong foundation it provided me. There are others I'd like to thank, including my many partners at Baker and McKenzie and PwC, both in the US and around the world, who provided me with the challenges, opportunities, and support to build my practice and my international business career. My closest professional relationships were forged with my partners in these world-class organizations. And now, on a more personal level, I want to express my sincere thanks to Pam Shuey, my longtime EA, and more recently, the driver of our Global Disputes Network. Thank you, Pam, for the more than 30 years of daily, many times hourly, even minute-to-minute -minute support it would not have been possible to build the career that I've been blessed with if you had not joined me at Baker all those years ago and then continued with me to PwC. Thank you for your dedication, work ethic, intellect, and commitment to take personal responsibility and perform at the highest levels of our profession. And to my family, to my seven children, and to your spouses and significant others, and to my 11 grandchildren, soon to be 12 grandchildren in about three months. I want you to know that as an only child growing up in Mississippi with no brothers and sisters, our large and diverse family is the best part of my life. And each of you is a treasure to me. Seeing the smiles on your faces and the love in your eyes are among my greatest blessings. Thank you for your support and your understanding over all these years. And to my strong, intelligent, and beautiful wife, Lynn. From our first meeting in the Big K stockroom, to our wedding in Oxford, to where we are today, and our receiving this special honor, we've done it all together. I express my gratitude for your unwavering support during our first three years together in law school and the 44 years since then. I don't know how you managed to do it all, from working during our law school days to building your own professional career in our early years, to raising our large family, to literally traveling the world with me, all the time trying to keep me grounded, pun intended. And so much more, wife, mother, grandmother, daughter and sister, you are a rock to so many people, and you are my best friend. If Ole Miss Law School is the foundation of my legal career, you, Lynn, are the foundation of everything else. 
I have been blessed to have you by my side all these years as we have been sailing through life together. In closing, I humbly accept this recognition on behalf of my family and so many others who contributed to my career. From its earliest foundation and throughout the last four decades. It was said a long time ago that gratitude is the memory of the heart, and I am profoundly grateful for this honor and for all of you who made it possible. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 inductee David Swinson. I want to thank all of you for participating in this uh, event and this recognition tonight. Uh, we thank all of you for being part of the Ole Miss tradition, particularly the honorees who we recognize this night. Uh, I'll just leave you with this last bit of Ole Miss wisdom. Hotty toddy, go Rebels.